Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, first, uh, you can find these slides at that GitHub uh, link if you want to look at them in more detail. There are some links here and there. If you want to check them later. Uh, my name is Jorge Aparicio, also known as Japaric on GitHub. Uh, right now, I'm a master's student at Lulio University of Technology, and I'm working with Professor Per Lindgren, and we do research on real-time system, and we are using ROS uh, for our research. Today, I will talk about concurrency in microcontrollers. Uh, so the agenda for this talk is to go through microcontrollers basics and then cover cooperative multitasking and then go into preemption as an alternative for doing multitasking. And we'll talk about the problems that arise from using preemption as a multitasking mechanism. And then we'll talk about locks as a way to solve those problems. Then I'll present a fearless concurrency framework we have been developing. And I conclude on some future work in this space. Uh, first, microcontrollers. Uh, so we have these single core devices where uh, very small amount of RAM and few processing power. So why would you want to use a microcontroller in your application? Uh, the main reason is to want, you want to do I.O. with the world. So when you are working with general purpose computers, I.O. means files, sockets, and databases. And when you're working with microcontrollers, I.O. means reading sensors, controlling motors. Um, some of you uh, also maybe know that you can use uh, single board computers like the Raspberry Pi to do this kind of I.O. So why would you pick a microcontroller instead of a Raspberry Pi, which uh, is more powerful and uh, runs uh, operating system like Linux. So within those reasons, we have that microcontrollers are cheaper, uh, which is good for uh, business. Uh, they are simpler systems. So they are simple enough that you can uh, program them from scratch. They also have lower power consumption, which is good for better life. Uh, most importantly, you can have full control over how tasks get scheduled on this system if you're not using an operating system. And this is important if uh, you have timing requirements in your application. Um, and in this talk, I will be talking about bare metal system when there is no underlying OS. That's when you get full control over the scheduling of tasks. And this is a min minimal microcontroller program uh, using the Quick Start framework. Uh, it looks no different from other uh, ROS program. Uh, we have this new student attribute at the top, which means that the standard library is not available in this program. Then we have some crates that will care of uh, booting the device. Then we, you have your standard, a standard mining function. And an uh, important thing to note here is that on bare metal systems, uh, you can only run one program at a time, and this program must never end. So in this case, with the, when the main function returns, it will put your microcontroller to sleep. Uh, this quick start framework gives you uh, this common um, level of support across different devices. And currently, it supports Cortex-M and MSP for 30 microcontrollers. And some is already working on porting these to RISC-5 microcontrollers. Next, how we do I.O. on a microcontroller? Uh, basically, we have to just write or read memory, uh, a special region of memory called peripheral memory. So this program does, does uh, two write operations, and the first one will turn an LED on, and the second one will turn it off. Uh, this approach to I.O. is called memory map I.O. Um, Let's look at three common peripherals that I use in some examples in this talk. Uh, the first one is called general purpose input output. So this peripheral lets you uh, send digital signals through the microcontroller pins. And with proper uh, electronics, you can use that to turn things on and off. And the input part of this peripheral lets you uh, read some external binary state, like uh, is, a pro is a button is pressed or not. And in this talk, I'll, I'll use this high-level LED abstraction. We give us an API to turn it 
on or off. Uh, another peripheral I'll be using are timers. Uh, timers are useful to generate periodic tasks and also to measure the duration of external events. And in this program, uh, we use the timer as a periodic alarm. And, and we'll use this alarm to blink an LED. Um, so we use this big wait method, which is a blocking method. We will wait until the alarm goes off. And we'll use that to generate the delays in this program. Uh, how does this uh, view weight method works? So uh, this timer, uh, you can read its titles in a, using, by reading the status register. This status register is a 32 bit of memory, uh, peripheral memory. And when the alarm goes off, uh, one of the bits of this status register will be changed to one. So what we do in this method is continuously pull the state of, of the, the register until the bit is set to one. That indicates that the alarm has gone off. Uh, this approach uh, is called busy waiting because the processor will be uh, continuously pulling a register. It's, uh, a wasteful approach to do um, I.O., but it gives us the delay we want. Another peripheral I'll be using is uh, it's called Serial, which stands for Serial Port Communication. And Serial Port Communication is this interface that lets you exchange data between two endpoints. Uh, at any given time, each endpoint can send data to the other side. Uh, this program here will start by reading a uh, sending a greeting to the other endpoint, and then it will wait for some input. Uh, every byte it receives, it will send it back to the, to the other side. So basically, it's kind of, uh, it will echo back all the received data. Uh, here as well, all the methods are blocking. Now we can move uh, on to concurrency. Uh, Let's say that we want to run these two previous programs uh, at the same time. So we want to create a new program that runs uh, uh, the, the two previous tasks uh, concurrently. We can use an approach which is called cooperative multitasking uh, using generators. So here's uh, the method for reading a byte from the interface, uh, from the serial interface using generators. So it looks similar to the uh, p method I showed you before, but instead of continuously pulling the, the status register, in this case, what this method will do is yield control back to the caller while the condition is, is not met. And then it will return the byte when it becomes available. So uh, using this generator-based API, we can uh, write the task as infinite generators. Uh, the first task is this echo program from before. The logic looks exactly the same. We'll read one byte and then send it back. Uh, we'll use the generator API, and we use the await macro uh, to drive this generator to completion. Uh, the important thing here is that the await macro doesn't block um, until the operation is complete, but instead it will yield control to the caller when it cannot make any more progress. Uh, and the other task is the lead blinking task. Uh, here I have changed slightly the logic so you can see that generators can capture variables allocated on the stack. Uh, the, the own variable will track the state of the LED and we'll use that to turn it on or off. And to generate the delay, we'll use the a generator uh, version of the await method with the await uh, macro. Uh, with those two tasks, uh, we can put them together in a program. And to execute them concurrently, we have this infinite loop that will resume the generators uh, one after the other. What this will do is that each ta the processor will execute each task uh, until it cannot make any more progress on that, on that task, and then will switch to the other task and resume its operation. Uh, so effectively, this runs uh, the two programs from before concurrently. Note that this program still has busy waiting. When the processor cannot uh, make progress on any of the tasks, it will still continuously pull the status register. 
uh, which burns uh, CPU cycles. Uh, now imagine this scenario. You need to execute two periodic tasks concurrently, like in the previous example. But this time, let's say that task one needs to be executed uh, every 10 milliseconds and takes two milliseconds to complete. And the second task needs to be run every one milliseconds and takes 100 microseconds to complete. So can this timing constraint be satisfied using cooperative multitasking? If, if we analyze uh, this problem and say that task one is executed first and then one millisecond passes while we're executing task task, uh, we'll get a request to execute the second task. But since we're using cooperative multitasking, if task one never yields control back to the caller, we'll continue its execution for another millisecond. That means that in those two milliseconds, we didn't execute the task two. With had to be run at least twice in that amount of time. So task two uh, missed its deadline twice in, if, in this case. And if, if this were a real time application, uh, that would mean uh, a system failure because in real time systems you cannot miss a, a single deadline. So in general, using cooperative multitasking, we cannot always uh, meet the timing constraints uh, instead, we need uh, task prioritization. In this example, if we had uh, task prioritization, we could give task two a higher priority. And that means that the processor could have switched from executing task one to execute task two, which has higher priority. Once it's done with that, then it can resume execution of task one. Basically, we are saying here is that task two can preempt the first task. Um, microcontrollers uh, provide a hardware mechanism for preemption, which are interrupts. And basically, interrupts are a callback mechanism provided by the hardware. So how do they work? Um, so each interrupt is triggered by a different event, external event. And you can register an interrupt handler for each interrupt. And this interrupt handler is basically just a function. Uh, in this program, uh, we register an interrupt for the XT0 interrupt. Uh, we register this handler function to deal with that interrupt. And this interrupt is triggered by when the user press a button. So in this case, uh, the microcontroller will usually be executing the main function. But at some time, at some point, the user will press the button. And when that happens, the hardware will call our, our interrupt handler. Once the processor is done executing that interrupt handler, it will resume the execution of the main function. So what we can say here is that uh, the interrupt handler can preempt the main function. Other way to see this is that the interrupts have a higher priority than the main function. Uh, we can port uh, one of the previous examples I gave, uh, the echo program. And in this case, we can move all the logic into an interrupt handler. And we can set the interrupt to be triggered every time a new data is available. Uh, in this case, there is nothing to do in the main loop since all the logic will be handled in the interrupt handler. So in the main loop, we can send the microcontroller to sleep, which saves uh, energy. So <laughs> this program ha has no VC weighting and is more energy efficient. So when you're working one interrupt, at some point you will want to share memory between the main function and the interrupt handler, or have some means of communication. Uh, and actually, the only way to do that is to have a statically allocated uh, variable. And probably the first thing you will try is to use this static build variable to, to share memory between them. And the problem with these uh, variables is that uh, access to them is unsynchronized, and if you do that, you will run into data races and race conditions. So how can we do this memory sharing in a memory safe way? Uh, one way is to use locks to synchronize the operations. So looking again at uh, the previous program, uh, we have the main function and the inner handling, uh, both modify this shared data variable. And the problem with this program is that 
if the main function is modifying the data variable and it gets preempted by the inner of handler, then the inner of handler might observe that the data variable is, is in some inconsistent state or it might even find corrupted data. Uh, so to solve this problem and this data race, what we have to do is synchronize these two operations of the chair mem on the chair memory. Uh, the synchronization for, synchronizi for synchronizing these two operations is just enough that one happens before, after the other, uh, and the other order is not important as long as both operations ha doesn't happen midway the other. And we can do that uh, by disabling the interrupts uh, in the main functions. And when we do that, while the main function is modifying the data variable, the interrupt handler cannot preempt it. That means that the other uh, operation of the, on the chair memory will only happen either before or after the operation in the, in the main function. And this gives us the synchronization to eliminate that data race, and this program is now memory safe. Note that uh, in contrast with mutexes, which you use in standard ROS program, uh, in this case, not, not the, uh, the interrupt handler doesn't need to lock the data, doesn't need to disable interrupts, because it cannot be preempted by any other uh, interrupt handler. Now, what happens if we add another inner of handler to the previous program? And let's say that both uh, main and the two inner ops are contending for the data. Is this program memory safe? Uh, and the answer is, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the architecture. Uh, if you are running this on an MSP430 microcontroller, then entire architecture uh, inner ops are disabled when you are executing an interrupt. That means that if you are executing one of these interrupt handlers, then it cannot get preempted, which means there is no data race on the operation that ex is executing the interrupt handler. So in, it, in that case, it's memory safe. But if, if instead you were targeting a cortex and microcontroller, uh, this architecture lets you uh, assign priorities to the interrupt handlers. Um, Interrupt handlers with higher priority can preempt lower priority interrupts. And in that case, we cannot answer this question without knowing what's the exact priorities of both interrupts. Um, so not long let's say that we are working with Cortex and microcontrollers, and we have these three interrupts contending for the data, but this time we know the priority of each one. Uh, this version of the program is memory safe. Uh, note that only the two lower priority interrupts need to lock uh, the data before accessing it because they can be preempted by the highest priority interrupt. And the highest priority interrupt doesn't need any lock to access the data since it cannot be preempted by anything else. Now let's tweak that example a little bit. Again, three, three interrupts with different priorities. And this time only the two uh, priorities with the lowest, uh, uh, two interrupts with the lowest priorities access the data, but the highest priority interrupt doesn't access the data. So this program is memory safe because the lower priority interrupt is blocking uh, the XT1 uh, interrupt handler from preemption. We must know that the race can happen here. But if we are using this interrupt fully uh, lock, uh, this operation will also block the highest priority interrupt from running. But in this case, that interrupt doesn't need to be blocked because it doesn't access the data. So what, can we improve this situation? Uh, if, if we lock higher priority tasks from running, uh, that's not good from a scalability point of view because higher priority interrupts are supposed to run uh, because they, they have higher priority and they are not supposed to be blocked by lower priority interrupts unless it's required for memory safety. So we can use a different kind of lock, uh, and this is valid only for cortex and devices. So instead of disable all the interrupts, we can raise the interrupt priority temporarily, uh, just to block some of the interrupts. Uh, and these are the actual operations that need to be done. And they only work for Cortex-M3 devices and, and newer. 
Uh, if we use now this different lock uh, in the previous program, uh, we raise the interrupt to two, we raise the priority to two and the lowest priority interrupt. We'll get uh, the required synchronization to about the data race, but this time the XT2 uh, inner won't be blocked by the lowest priority interrupt. Uh, but in general, how we can we pick this uh, temporarily raised uh, priority? And this is a problem that has been studied by the real time research community since the 80s. And an answer to that is the immediate ceiling priority protocol. So in this uh, uh, scheduling policy, this raised priority value is called uh, ceiling priority. And each resource, which means each shared variable, is assigned this priority ceiling, which is a priority equal to the highest priority of any task which might lock the resource. So we basically have to, have to take the maximum value among all the priorities of the inner of that access the, the variable. Uh, and this scheduling policy has an uh, extra nice uh, extra pr uh, property, which is nice, which guarantees the lock free execution if you use it, use it correctly. Uh, now we have seen uh, how to use lock uh, to prevent data races. But even if you follow these guidelines, uh, doing so by harness is tedious and error prone. And also all the programs have a bit of unsafe code in them. Instead, we like to write just uh, safe ROS code and have the compiler enforce the uh, memory safety for us. And that's what, where we have the real time for the masses framework, which is dubbed as RDFM. Uh, this is actually a part of the real time for the masses language to the uh, ROS language. Uh, this language was developed at Yulee University of Technology. And it has uh, some really nice properties. Uh, so in this framework, the concurrency model is that you have tasks and resources. And each task in this model maps to a, a single interrupt, uh, which means that you can assign priorities to tasks. And by using interrupts, we, you can have the hardware schedule the task for you, which means you don't have any uh, bootkeeping in, in your software. So basically, there is no code for the scheduler. And the resource in this model is a zero cost mechanism to share memory. It's basically the logs saw before. And the framework uses this ICPP uh, scheduling policy, which guarantees the log freedom. And all the ceilings which are required by this uh, policy are automatically computed by the framework. And since this model uses tasks which are interrupts, uh, its main strength is writing event-driven uh, preemptive multitasking, but you can still do a cooperative multitasking without the beginning. Uh, the downside of all these nice properties is that the framework requires whole program analysis, but as we'll see, it is not much of a problem in the current implementation, at least. So let's see how one uh, RDFM application looks like. And all of them have this app macro, which is a specification of the application. So the app macro will have a declaration of all the resources and all the tasks in your application. And the resources basically look like uh, static variables. And each task entry, what we'll do is bind an interrupt to a task. And each one of these tasks will have a priority and a list of the resources it has access to. Uh, in this particular example, we have two resources and two tasks that run at different priorities. And uh, the own resource is only accessed by one task, and the shared resource is accessed by both tasks. Um, this app macro is where we have this uh, whole program analysis uh, downside. Uh, so the thing is that this app macro will has to have all your tasks and resources declared there, and you can only have one instance of this macro in your application. 
uh, this basically means that you cannot split the declaration of tasks and resources across different grades. So this sub macro will expand into the uh, main function. So in the user will have to supply uh, these two init and idle functions instead of the main function. So this init function will run first and will take care of initialization. And it has access to all the peripherals. And it will run with uh, inner of disabled. And after has in initialization has been complete, uh, uh, inner of will be re-enabled, and you have this idle function. This idle function is a never-ending function, and you can do cooperative multitasking here. Uh, and then the user can write tasks uh, as normal Rust functions. And the signatures you see here are generated by the uh, framework. Uh, this resource, uh, resources struct here is generated also by the framework and enforces uh, the resource access as specified in the app macro. And the other thing that does is minimizes login operations. So in this case, uh, we see that in the second task, it cannot access the owning resource because in the specification we said that this task uh, doesn't have access to that resource. And it minimizes locking here. Um, as you can see, the first task can access its own resource without any client of lock. And the highest priority task, which is the second one, can access the shared uh, resource without any locking. But the first task, which has lower priority, has to lock uh, the resource to be able to access it. Uh, so the RTFM framework uses lock as, uh, uh, as a means to guarantee synchronization. But we also want to support uh, other synchronization uh, patterns. Uh, for example, you can also use Atomics for synchronization. And we are working on uh, letting you use those uh, with RTFM. Uh, because right now, if you use them, you will have to lock <laughs> Atomic to be able to use it. And the other research case that uh, users have raised is that uh, there is this common abstraction of a ring buffer which has a single producer and a single consumer. In this case, you can kind of split your ring buffer into a producer and a consumer, and this uh, data structure is uh, inner safe and lock free. And you can run the producer and the consumer on different tasks uh, without any kind of locking. And we're also working to get uh, that working with RTFM without uh, locking. Uh, what's next in this uh, application space of real time systems? Uh, so RTFM gives you this uh, preemptive multitasking that is very efficient, but is basically just a toolbox uh, of concurrency primitives. And the main way to do uh, communication between tasks is using shared memory, but shared memory can get uh, harder to reason about when you have larger programs. So the next extension of the real-time frame, uh, real-time for the masses framework, are concurrent reactive objects. Um, which kind of look like this. Uh, so, yeah, I guess you won't see that very well, but uh, uh, in this case, we have a different model. Uh, we'll move to objects uh, instead of resources, and we use message passing as a means of communication between these objects. So, and in this example, we have three objects, and each one can pass information to the next one using message passing. So we have both synchronous and asynchronous messages uh, in this uh, framework. And asynchronous message uh, will be posted to an scheduler and will be executed later. Uh, one other thing we have here is that we are adding timing semantics. So you can specify the timing uh, requirements of your application. Uh, so you can say how often uh, an interrupt is triggered. And with that information, the framework will take care of computing the priorities for you, so you don't have to specify them. Uh, this version of RTFM is not yet uh, released. We are still working on it. Uh, so expect a blog, a blog post uh, about that in the future. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, if, and if there is time.